I don't know if that's serious or not, okay? Let's, you know, let's let's go ahead and legalise cannibalism. How, how would that go down? Everyone would just be like, all right, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Thoughts on cannabis and do you use it at all? Oh, we're going for all the controversial topics today. I don't give a kahoot. <laughs> Rasby the player says, what do you think about conspiracy theories and freedom of speech? I agree, my friend. I agree. This whole idea that we should have freedom of speech, what a conspiracy it is. Yeah, we shouldn't have freedom of speech. No one needs that. In all seriousness, I think that freedom of speech is a principle that everyone should have access to. And yes, some people will come out with bad ideas and say nasty things, but that's part of living in a free society and we have to combat those bad things with compassion and better ideas, in my opinion. ACTV says we should also punish people for being assholes more, though. Uh, I disagree. I disagree strongly because a lot of time, especially on the internet, there is a lack of context, there is a lack of nuance in understanding what someone is saying when they are using text. It can be very easy to interpret language as being aggressive. I think you want to give people the benefit of the doubt within reason and try and be compassionate and kind, you know, encourage conversation because punishing people, you know, like being an arsehole is not a crime. Being mean to someone is, you know, not something that we think is punishable, right? Like punishable, what does that mean? Go to jail? Get in trouble? I mean, there's different degrees of what punishment means. So yeah. Is being rude to each other a part of freedom of speech? Says Surprise T. Yeah, I heard this quote the other day that I really liked, and I didn't write it down, but it really stuck in my head, that free, like living in a free society is being perpetually annoyed. I.e., if you're in a free society, you are going to rub up against other points of view, people that you disagree with. The, the problem is, is that we live in an environment where I feel like when you disagree with someone it's like you get pushed to the extreme of what that means that they then have to become the worst version of whatever it is they are about with their opinion you know it, it kind of it's kind of like sometimes the difference is in your own hands in your own in your own mind true it's not a crime but what i mean is i feel like being mean or rude should have more consequences yeah you know there are times when people just need to be taught a lesson but it's always it's always depends on the situation, depends on the context, right? I personally see so much stuff happening online that I feel like the opposite is more often needed, that people need to calm down. We need more compassion. We need more connection. We need to see our commonality uh, more so than our divisions and the things that separate us because there seems to just be so much of it. The thing is that if you restrict freedom of speech, even within the best intentions, you end up restricting all speech that goes against the status quo, says Shinny. That is really well worded and I couldn't agree more. Which is why when it comes to the infamous, uh, what's it called? The paradox of intolerance. I think the person who came up with that idea comes out, comes out with a conclusion that you need some level of intolerance towards intolerance, which I kind of don't agree with. Like you said, the status quo then becomes the defining part of all that. If we were to establish cannibalism as a legal thing, we're solving world hunger and overpopulation at the same time. What's your take on that? Um, I don't know if that's serious or not, okay? But first of all, let's, you know, let's, let's go ahead and legalize cannibalism. How, how would that go down? Everyone would just be like, all right, yeah, yeah, that's cool. We're cool with it. There, there wouldn't be any issues there, any social upheaval, no. Second of all, we've already solved world hunger. The problem is wastefulness and profitability around food. We can, we can make enough food for everyone. That's not an issue. It's that it can't be distributed in an economically profitable way where everyone gets to eat and can be made profit out of. So, if it were profitable to feed everyone, everyone would be fed. Those companies love to make profit, don't they? Oh, God, stop making profit. And you can argue that it's wrong. And I think, I think that it's, it's kind of wrong. Like, because you hear these stories about how, you know, there'll be like warehouses of food and it's cheaper to leave it there and destroy it than it is to ship it to somewhere where people need to eat. So that's a big problem. 
Yeah, I, and I've never ever heard anyone propose cannibalism. Like, how would that? Like, w what are you picturing? <laughs> that we would just, you know, run around the streets killing each other for food. That wouldn't go down very well. Oh, I, like, would you, what, you want to eat people? <laughs> Dang, I don't know. So we just wait for someone to oof and then eat them, which isn't illegal. Well, if it, if it weren't illegal, it wouldn't be illegal, right? So that's what this person's proposing. I don't know how that... Again, it would it would run into the same problem. Let's say let's say we did it, we legalized it, and then people went, uh, people actually went, yeah, we're cool with this, and didn't revolt. Then you'd run into the same problem, right? We've got a bunch of dead people over here, but it's not profitable to process and turn them into food for these poor people over there. So you just have the same problem, you know. <laughs> You'd have the exact same... You haven't solved anything with cannibalism. We kind of knew that already, though. Jeez, that's the wackiest... <laughs> the wackiest one I've heard in... Was that a serious suggestion? If it was, I don't think it was very well thought through. Also, a lot of morticians will go out of business because they can't afford to go to culinary school. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's great. Cat is live, so it's probably a joke, Lameo. It might be, but here's the thing, right? Like, have you ever read the subreddit, Shower Thoughts? People have really weird ideas all of the time that just require you to get over that initial eureka in your head and then go, oh yeah, here's a million reasons that doesn't work or whatever. I, I, I do it. I, I'm guilty of it. Like, I quite frequently think about stuff and then I'm like, oh, this wouldn't it be cool if you did, oh, yeah, 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 oh, no, wait a minute, that would that would be an absolutely idiotic idea. How did I not think of this other thing first? Flint says shower thoughts are my thoughts. <laughs> uh, shower thoughts crack me up, but they're often terrible. Cannibalism under the laws of many countries is technically legal. Of course, murder and homicide is illegal. This is to get around it being a survival situation. Or you're forced by someone to eat human. Of course, it happens. You'll need to have a very good reason to. I've heard like the occasional story, like horror story of accidental cannibalism, and everyone's heard probably like a survival story of of it as well. There was also that crazy story from Germany where that guy wanted to be eaten and met up with someone. I can't remember what happened in the end, but it was a pretty fascinating story. Uh, I myself don't really want to be... Do you know what? Actually, I say I don't want to be eaten, but here's the thing. I see I see death as being part of the cycle of life. You know, I, I'd be, like, for me, I don't want to be cremated because I learned that uh, crem cremation is actually bad for the environment and bad for your participation in the circle of life. So I would like to just have my corpse untouched you know just like no none of these damaging chemicals and all that sort of stuff they're damaging for the environment but they're like there to preserve bodies and whatnot i don't want any of that i just want to be chucked in a hole in the ground to rot right and go back into the cycle of life because if you get cremated your ashes aren't useful anymore for the cycle of life donate your body to science as winnie t ford well I i'm on the donor list thing i don't know if there's like a next level where it's like use my body for wacky experiments. I mean, I might sign up for that, I don't know. But I, I would like to just, you know, go go back into the ether or whatever, like become a part of the cycle of life again. So that would mean essentially becoming food for other people or, you know, through the food chain for, for animals first, then for something else. Liger says, assume of the Frankenstein experiment. Yeah, no, no thanks. <laughs> you see, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of like of the belief that if you donate your organs, I, I don't I don't think like there's gonna be some some sort of weird afterlife experience where that is a problem in one way or another. But I don't like the idea of donating your body to science because they're gonna like mess with the brain and I don't know, put a bunch of chemicals and electricity in there because I might shoot back into existence and exist in a form of eternal torment or something, you know? Like I d I don't want eternal torment. No thanks. It's not my cup of tea, all right? Ghost9 says, thoughts on cannabis and do you use it at all? Oh, we're going for all the controversial topics today. If you go to my Assumer Says channel, you can hear me talk about my uh, history with cannabis. 
It, it is not for me. I am not a drugs person, and I had to learn that the hard way. I listened to this really fascinating podcast a while back where someone was making an argument to legalize all drugs, and it was just one of the most intelligent ways of talking about it, and it's something that I commonly think about, which is education, because a lot of how we learn about things like this is more along the lines of things being moralized and... You're sort of given like a picture of something as opposed to being educated about all the details of something. And so when I heard about this argument to legalize all drugs from that perspective, I was kind of like, that's how I feel about a lot of stuff. When you hear about, I don't know, some horrible like racist group or whatever, and people want to silence them, I feel like it should be more about, no, 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 educate people about what this is and what they're saying and like what the other ideas are. Because I believe that the better ideas win out and and that m people are reasonable and, and decent and they get caught up in bad ideas because of a lack of an education, a lack of hearing other ideas and understanding things. Like the more you can know, the more you can learn about what you don't know as well. The Dunning-Kruger effect, as they call it. Sometimes you just don't know that you don't know something. You think you know it, but it turns out there's a lot more about that and you didn't know, and that's fine. Normally the simple ideas tend to win, says Shadow Warrior. Um, it's a bit like broad, a bit of a broad stroke there. That's why I think, you know, like education is important because I think you're more susceptible to have a bad time with drugs the less you know about them. The more you know about them, the better, the better informed you are to make a decision, right? And that's not saying that they're right or they're wrong, or that I know what's best for you or don't. I'm just saying the more information you would have as an individual would help you make a better decision in your life. It's true of anything. And so when drugs are demonized, people do not actually understand them. You know, if I, if I, knew, if I knew now what I know about cannabis and other drugs, I might have not actually done them when I were younger. Yeah, also telling people to shut up doesn't make them any less racist, for example. They're just racist in silence. Exactly. We need to understand the why. Always try to understand the why. If you understand the why, you can try to solve the problem, says Sir Demon. Well said, my friend. Well said. That is exactly how I feel about a lot of things, really. I think it's a two-edged sword. I fully agree that education is important, but it's also the person you're speaking to needs to be open to a change of mind. Otherwise, you might... As well talk to a wall right but talking to someone who isn't willing to change their mind isn't the worst thing ever the, the problem is when you encounter people like that the response tends to more often or not be people get aggravated they resort to insulting they don't they stop listening like it's okay to not agree with someone and walk away i think there is a lot of power in civility there because when you like people tend to not respond well to someone telling them they're wrong and shouting at them, oh, you're not listening or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't like further you anywhere. You just have to accept that, yes, some people are difficult. But a lot of people are probably not that difficult, but we get sucked into this like trap of talking to each other in an uncivil way. And I think that exacerbates the problem. We've got cheers and bits from G Castle 15 saying, you also have to look at people's pride and their ego that stops people from accepting other ideas. Yes, very well said again. And look, like uh, all of what I'm saying is something I've gone through myself. By the way, Wordy, Daryl Davis, I really like that guy. I've watched quite a few of like documentaries they've done on him. He's someone worth looking up and listening to, I think. But yeah, like pride and ego. A lot of what I'm saying comes from turning the light on myself, trying to like see where my own shortcomings are and ignorances are, and I notice things like that, like you have pride, you have ego, and they get in the way. Like it's so easy to like hear a piece of information that goes in contrast with what you believe and you naturally just sort of dismiss it. And it's very easy to see a headline or something written and it's like, oh, I'll read this because it confirms what I already think. Now, neither of those things speak to if it's actually wrong or right. That takes a lot more work to figure out. But like being able to spot that when you do it yourself, 
then you can see actually you know this is what we do as people this is why we should treat each other with more civility and stuff because we critique one another but we all fall short to the same things essentially right disagreements are normal especially in conversations like these and people are not really well educated on how to navigate hard conversations much any more unfortunately says basil bones yeah that's it you need to learn how to navigate those conversations as well and they are difficult i think one of the best things you can do though is to not be too invested in the idea that you're changing someone else's mind and be more open to just listening now if you're going to take someone with like an extremely unfavorable view and apply what i just said to it that might sound absurd but it's like if you learn why they think that way you might be able to say something that that you know helps them in some way or not but it it rarely comes from you know a position of moral authority or whatnot people have to like in some ways figure this stuff out on their own and it tends to come from like civility and being taken seriously which is like not how people treat each other in this day and age on the internet it's always just you know taking things to the extreme if you go on my twitter you'll notice that i don't actually follow anyone what i decided to do was categorize people that i air quotes follow I, I put them into lists so in one of these lists i follow someone who was calling out the whole air quotes like do your own research right when people say that you should do your own research and you know i agree there is something very wrong with that statement but immediately the tweet goes to like what is the worst possible interpretation of this you're going to call someone out who might say do your own research but then make it into the nastiest thing that that could mean you know and that's not helpful because now someone who reads that who you know might say do your own research then is equated to something really mean and horrible so like if we're gonna throw out tweets and ideas into the ether for anyone to see they need to be kind they need to be compassionate they need to be understanding like what is do your own research it's usually to throw doubt on whatever the narrative is in the conversation this idea that you actually need to go and look into this for yourself because you would find something different which sort of to some people sounds reasonable the thing with that is is that we maybe overestimate our ability to do research and to like again the dunning kruger effect you don't know what you don't know. I've never taken like a course in doing research. I, you know, I vaguely understand how the peer review system works. I think the average person may not realize that they're not equipped with the tools to do decent research. And the reason I think this is because I watch a lot of like education -y videos and I like to learn about shortcomings of the mind and thought and like how you can be tricked with thinking and then you kind of notice all these pitfalls of our own sense of reasoning and a lot of people who might do their own research might not know these concepts or ideas and maybe if they did then learn of them they might perhaps question some of their own research that they've done research involves citing examples having peers review your findings and writings says Baytan Daniil yeah and you know on a surface perspective of times where I've seen that whole do your research thing being thrown around sometimes it kind of just looks like you're just finding some article somewhere after a quick google search that reinforces your worldview now one of the problems with people googling information is that you tend to google for the answer you're looking for you tend to search for the answer as opposed to search for contradictions right like if you have some belief like oh i believe that the world is flat you're more likely to go to a search engine to type is the world flat than is the world not flat right and so <laughs> it's hard to think about how what you're doing can be balanced and and fair we, we just naturally do things like this this is just i've become aware of it now and i have to catch myself doing it and it's tough work you know it's super easy to like it happens to me every now and then when i uh let's say something political happens or whatnot and i go like do a little search to find out about it and then i kind of realize i'm sort of searching for the thing that's going to back up what i think about this 
The Yellow House says, that's a weird statement. Do your own research can be both good and bad. If it's used as make sure to fact check stuff, then I 100% agree. But if it is thinking that you can single-handedly do research that is as credible as what professionals in the field do, then it becomes problematic. Yeah, Harold, I um I get exactly what you're saying. I agree with you for the most part. I just think it's the context that do your own research comes up in that is the problem, right? Like when you hear that being said, it is usually for the first thing that you said. It is people, uh, sorry, not first thing. It is usually people going about it the wrong way, right? Like take something like the election in America, which some people believe was stolen, right? That it wasn't a true election or whatever. Now, if you're of that belief because of the information you've been exposed to, you are more likely to search for information that proves you're right than you are to, by default, search for information that proves you're wrong. And if you're on the flip side of it, you're more likely to look up for information that says, oh no, it was all legitimate and here's why, than you are to look for something that says it wasn't legitimate. So, and like the average person is probably not equipped with the tools to do a deep dive on how the electoral system works and what all the checks and balances in place are and the who's who. And yeah, concepts like these have like, I guess have kind of like contributed to the erosion of like institutional trust as well as the institutions doing things that are genuinely untrustworthy at time. The thing with doing your own research is looking up information that both confirms and denies your thoughts. That is the way you don't get biased. Shinny, that sounds about right. You know, as, as someone who likes a lot of um, science-y, education-y, edutainment on YouTube, I noticed this, like, thing, and I don't know if I'm describing it properly, but, like, in the scientific community, you both actively try to prove and disprove your own theories. Like, if you have a theory, part of presenting that is, like, here's the reasons why... I think it could work and then it's like here's all the things that I did to try and prove that it didn't because if you're trying to prove something it's probably not a bad idea to start off trying to disprove it because that that tends to be quite easy to like break someone else's idea or hypothesis with an experiment. Sektrov, thank you for 21 months. I actively teach my team about common confirmation biases, situational awareness, and understanding the limitations of your own brain's information and intelligence gathering is essential to learning and improving any social technical system. That sounds cool. I immediately want to know more about who you work with and what you do, because that sounds so like an intelligent way to approach it. That's awesome, dude. There's this really great book that I read that really like sparked me off on all of this stuff years ago called Actually, I don't know what the book is called. It might be called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, but uh, Daniel Kahneman, that's the one, yeah. This guy did a ton of like research into how we think reactively in situations and how we have like different types of thought system, ones that can like fire off quickly and then another one that's like a much more slow and thoughtful system. And through examining these and like putting them through different kind of like trials and experiments just like learn so many interesting quirks of how we think and how we have like shortcomings with with that with that thought it, it was super super interesting to learn about william co martin says confirmation bias echo turret chamber etc there are a million terms for it yeah yeah we all need to learn we need to learn about these things again i feel like it's education that could really help here the more we understand our own shortcomings the better we should also not jump on the bad wagon of calling out echo chambers, etc. We're also prone to entering our own echo chambers, says Hytron. Yep, re that's really well said, um, especially the, the calling out. Like, I think when we point out echo chambers to one another, again, it's that whole civility thing that when someone disagrees with someone else, what you might see on the internet is someone being, get out of your echo chamber, that kind of thing, right? Now, an echo chamber is less this thing that someone else is in and more of an environment that we're all in okay it's kind of hard to see because you don't often think about how content is displayed to you on the internet it's driven by algorithms it's driven by your viewing history like the echo chamber that i'm in is my youtube subscription feed and how youtube recommends me things that i like like it keeps me locked into a certain set of topics and ways of thinking i don't tend to like just jump out and see some random stuff that's happening in another little sphere in, in YouTube.
like echo chamber is less of a you're wrong because you're in an echo chamber thing and more of a we need to be aware of how the internet works and how the information that we consume tends to just be a reinforcement of what we already like especially when algorithms are constantly driving and feeding us with information that we you know it knows we're going to like and get along with right that's why that's why it's sending it our way shinny i'm glad you like these conversations it's been a while since we've had one really I get a bit exhausted talking about this stuff, I think, just from time to time. Like, I th you have to be careful because when you go into these topics, it can be quite easy to expose yourself to people that... Well, I, I'm wording this wrong. It, like, it's not other people, it's me. I'm, I, can, I can take what people say on the internet the wrong way all too easily just because I have a bit of a, like a, a negative propensity in my mind. Like, it will be easy for me to just misunderstand something or take it in a negative way. So one of the experiences of doing the Asuma Says channel was like having to deal with a lot of different opinions coming back at me, which I wasn't really too well equipped for. And also a lot of those opinions I, I took very seriously and learned from as well. Like it's not just a, oh, you know, I don't agree with you, that doesn't make me feel good kind of thing. <laughs> Twitch Asuma is way different from YouTube Asuma. In the best way possible and I love it, says Pikachu. Thanks, my dude. I mean, if you go over to the Asuma Says channel, if you haven't seen it already, then you might, you know, you might hear more of this on YouTube. When I'm streaming, it's about hanging out, having a good time. Sometimes we get a little philosophical and, and deep with the stuff. That's just the way I think about stuff. I'm, I like, I don't know. It's just what I, what I do. I just think this way a lot and that's me. One of the things that really helps is just to like try and try and anchor what you're saying a bit more in principle and less in emotion. It'd be quite easy to think emotionally about this stuff and then you get like sucked into the trap of us and them and that kind of thinking. So a moment ago we were talking about echo chambers, right? And how YouTube will recommend stuff to you. I found something amazing on YouTube. If you're a fan of 90s hip hop, then this will probably interest you. The, the way I found it, though, is actually because of, uh, I think because of Limbiscuit's new album, like, it's been pushing Limbiscuit videos, and it's DJ Premier talking about his involvement in the song End Together now, which I didn't actually know he was involved in. And it comes from a series he's doing where he talks you through how some of the classic songs that he produced in the 90s came together, and specifically focusing on this... Um, floppy disk technology that they use to make their songs with sampling and whatnot. Now, I knew that floppy disk was a technology that you could use to make music back in the 90s. I kind of found this out retroactively recently um, by watching YouTube channels where they, they do like retro tech where they go back and look at stuff from the past. And because I was, it was a while ago, I was watching some stuff related to mixing music and learning about that and then YouTube's like well do you want to learn about this retro mixing of music and then I learned about how you could actually use floppy disks to store and move music around and I was like oh that's super interesting didn't know that like it was a key part of a lot of the classic hip-hop stuff that I listened to and so um, DJ Premier has this channel where he's you know he's on YouTube doing the YouTuber thing he's just started this series where he goes over classic songs like the one he did for Biggie, Big L um, the first one I think was like Gangstar and there's one with Nas and he does the Limp Bizkit song and you just hear the story behind how the song came together and it just reminds me of well of like the kind of access we have to stuff and people today is so different if you were to learn any of that stuff like 10-15 years ago it would have been all like television documentary style and it would have been done in like a very unpersonal way. But now you hear like direct from the mouth of the person who made the song, like their own thoughts on it and stuff. And it's just, it just reminded me of like how, how things have changed and developed and how cool all that is. I wonder how many people here have actually used a floppy disk, says Lee and Query. <laughs> well, I, I used a, a floppy disk as a kid and then... Maybe when I was really, really young, might have had some of those crazy, like, super floppy disks that, like, the BBC computer, whatever that thing was called, the BBC Micro, used to use. 
Yeah, you used to get like demo discs or you know demos on the floppy disks, right? Of games, or you could buy games. Like it was, it was a medium for, for you know, a computer game or for media. So, um, it's it's, you know, like a CD. It was just something that was older and came before all of that. I didn't, I didn't know that they could like store that kind of information on it though. I imagine the samples were either like references to having a source sample plugged into the system, or maybe they had the compression to like take small samples and work with them. I don't know, but you could certainly fit all the programming on that stuff because like MIDI is uh really lightweight. Like MIDI files can store a lot of information about music and be really small files. And you can like use them across multiple computers very easily as well. Using floppy disks approximately ten to install Windows three point eleven. Yeah I remember those days. I remember those days. I think I had like Doom 2 on like six floppy disks or something. Logical Geek Boy says, Well, floppy disks were a luxury when they came out. We used tapes before that and they were a pain. I got to use the tapes, yep. On the old Amstrad. I have to listen to it loading for ages. It's amazing how, how like attention spans have been changed by like the changing of technology, but the technology is amazing as well. I was just thinking about it the other day. It's like I'm watching something on my phone. And then, like, I'm I'm in the kitchen cooking, so then I just quickly switch it over to my iPad. And then when I'm done cooking, I, like, then cast it to my telly. And, you know, i got, like, this playlist of, like, instantly accessible video information. And I can just seamlessly watch it between different devices. It's incredible. And it'll, it'll, it'll find ways to get better. I, I think um, voice recognition will probably, as it gets more integrated, probably really push things to a level where, like, I mean, a lot of people are probably already out there doing it already, but, you know, uh, I got this, like, uh, headset for listening to music that's got, like, a microphone built into it, so I can take calls on it and just, like, tap the ear button and uh, take a call. But, you know, it's also got a microphone. I can probably get my phone, Google Assistant or whatever, and just... Google Assistant, do this, do that. I mean, I don't like using those features very much, but I could probably uh, make use of them now. Which is just kind of crazy, just walking around and, like, telling it what to do. You know? Like, instead of me, like, pressing the buttons on my phone to change the things, um, just talking to it to get it to do it, that seems like a real possibility. Ikarasu says, For me, too many choices. But if you suffer from choice paralysis, which I often do, I think it's really good to um, pre-pick some things, pre-plan what you're going to be interested in. Because in the moment, like, I don't know, when there's so much that you could choose from, it just makes me feel, like, oddly dissatisfied. So I try to, like, imagine that there's not as many choices because I've already picked this thing. And when I do that, I just find it so much more enjoyable to, like, not think about all the things you could be watching, this thing might be better, or whatever, just like pick something and roll with it. I don't give a kahoot. <laughs> you know, one of those sayings that I uh, I don't like, what I used to love when I was younger, was like, I don't give a fudge. It's just like, <laughs> I've realised that I actually immensely give a fudge about a lot of stuff. I care a lot. I want I want humanity to succeed. What can I say? I do give a fudge. I, I want a shirt that says, I just do give a fudge. Would that be a good shirt? Would you want that? Don't you want to eat the fudge, says Liger Gaming? That's what it could say on the back. <laughs> but I get it. Like I a lot of the time the the expression is said, it's I feel like it's more of an expression of like frustration and wanting to be free of that. Like you see all this craziness in the world and you're like, ah, oh, I just don't give a damn. It's like, maybe you do. Maybe you do, really. It's just all a bit too messy to deal with. By fudge, do you mean the alternative word that we should never say, says Ben Does Games? Yes, I mean the alternative word to the word that you should never say. Because I said so. Don't say it! Girl. It'll give you a dopamine rush in your brain. It's a, it's an addiction. 